da, da, da. All right, just thinking for a minute. Okay, I'm doing a re-record of, this is part 14 of Spindle's End, one of two. Uh, and Rosie has just gotten back through legions of pernicious forces and has just made it back to Woodwold and through the gates by the skin of her teeth or the skin of her pants, uh, because her legs did get knocked by the gate. And Spear, the large, large uh, boarhound, is kind of keeping the fast and the dogs moving so they don't, um, so their muscles don't seize up. Rosie is off, to the, off towards Woodwold. Rosie started hurrying off and then thought, back soon? From what? What do I have to hurry toward? She stopped on the far side of the courtyard, a few steps before, before she had to, because while the drive was open, Woodwold was still swaddled in rose stems, just as she had left it. She looked up at the sky again, but drizzly gig grey no longer comforted her. She listened to the silence, knowing what it meant, knowing what she would find when she went back into the great hall. I should be hurrying, she thought, for the danger is no less than it was. I have merely eluded it again for the moment. But I do not know my course. I haven't even rescued Peony. I don't know where she is, nor Narl and the others. It's all very well, what Rock said. No one was after us. But now I'm inside the briar hedge again, and they're still out there with Pernicious Army, who will be a lot quicker to grab the next lot, because the first ones got away. What have I done after all, she thought. What have I done? I suppose Pernicia will just come for me again, and I may have killed fast. Maybe Narl can get Peony right away. Maybe if they go far enough, Peony will wake up. Then at least, out of all of us, Narl and Peony. She sat down slowly at the edge of the courtyard and wrapped her arms around her pulled-up knees and rocked back and forth, her mind empty. She hardly noticed when two hounds came up to her and pressed themselves round her, rather as they had done at the princess ball as if they were holding her together, as if they were aware that she needed holding together. Vaguely she felt Rock licking one ear, and someone else, Fru, she thought, licking the other. She was half asleep when the words, if, after all, they were words, entered her understanding. She could not say she heard them, for the taking in of meaning was as much deeper in and other than human than animal speech was, than animal speech as animal speech was deeper in and other than, than human. It's a lot of other than, 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 than. It was as though meaning grew somewhere in the center of her body, as if the marrow of her bones were talking to her. She felt in her body that pernicious castle was gone. She felt that there had been a hard place that hurt her. She could almost feel where it had been, low under her, ref, her left ribs, left ribs, <coughs> that had disintegrated fallen back to the earth it was made from, that the sun and rain upon it would make good earth of it in time to come, not merely the crumbled remains of the castle as it was now. Lying like a shattered vase upon a floor, still glittering with the paint the maker of it had laid upon it, a tint of dark magic. For now, the important thing was that it was no longer a castle, could no longer be a castle. Its maker would not put it together again. And Rosie had done this, Narl had done this, Flinks and Sunflower and Zell and Hrock and Throstle and all of them had done this. Weaker, Rosie thought, very dimly, for it was difficult in this deep in place to put anything in human words. We have weakened her. It was not everything, but it was something. They had, all of them together, done something. She felt the effort round her, under her and over her, the effort to speak so that she could hear, and knew that and know that she was not alone with five hounds and a horse, willing and loyal though they were, little flimsy, squashy creatures, almost as fragile and insubstantial as she was herself. Woodwold. Woodwold was talking to her. Rosie. Princess. I... I am here too. Woodwold was awake. Slowly she uncurled herself, finding it strange that she could do so, that she appeared to be this light, airy, bendable creature 
She weighed so little it seemed to her surprising that she did not float away like a leaf. How precarious to stand on feet, to carry what substance one had in this scanty and attenuated manner. She shook herself and took a deep breath. Frock and Fru came to their feet and looked at her expectantly. She turned back to look toward where the great hall lay behind its embrace of rose stems, and then found her own feet and ordered them to take her there. She went unerringly to a certain snarly mess of rose stems, visibly no different from any other among the great hummocky hills of rose stems beneath which lay Woodwold, and prized them apart with her hands, and they permitted themselves to be prized. She ducked and stepped underneath, and began carefully to part those that now wound across her way, and they too permitted themselves to be moved aside. She caught herself on a thorn once, and a drop of blood fell from the tip of her forefinger, and she held her breath and thought of Piri. Hmm. It's the magic sleep. The magic sleep has got me. She and thought of Piri. And then she put her hands out again to pull at the next layer of rose stems, and saw another drop of blood fall twinklingly from her finger and onto a hunched brown elbow of stem. And then she was through the next low, twisted arch, and reaching for the next beyond it. She came after some little time to the old doors of the great hall, and here she stood on tiptoes and brushed at the stems that hung round it, as if they were no more than cobwebs, and they broke and fell aside at her touch, as if they were cobwebs indeed. The sunlight seemed to fall on her more strongly than it had before, and she turned round and saw behind her two hounds and a great tall arch stretching through the rose hedge. And yet, as she had made her way through it, the parting she had made had only been enough to let her through if she crouched and held her arms close to her sides. And once Fru had yelped, following her, as he misjudged. She took a deep breath, and turned back to the doors and flung them open, the old doors that had been opened for the first time in over a century for the princess' one and twentieth birthday, and which had required four men on each to persuade them, and the light rushed in to brighten as much of the floor as it could reach. But most of the great hall was still dark from the gnarled rose stems over its windows. That's the first thing, she thought. She went to the tall window nearest her, scrambled up to stand on its sill, fumbled with the latch, and put her hands through against the rose stems, pushing at them, as if they were no more than an odd sort of curtain, but pushing gingerly on account of the thorns, her fingers still throbbed where she had caught it before. The thick branches creaked and gave, and she pushed a little more vigorously, and they rustled as they parted, and the sunlight came in. And she noticed that it looked like sunlight, that it was no longer grey and gloomy, and when she peered up, the sky was blue, and the shreds of cloud that drifted across it were white. And when she looked again at the rose stems, she noticed that they were now covered with leaves, which was why they had rustled, but they had been bare and brown but minutes before. She clambered down from the window sill and went on to the next, and pushed back the suddenly green rose stems from that window, and the next, and the next, and when she came to the last, she saw flower buds among the leaves although the princess's birthday was in early spring. Only when there were no more windows to free from their blindfolds did she turn into the hall. It was almost worse being able to see, because it emphasized how wrong what she saw was. She found Catriona at once, and knelt beside her again, stroking her hair. She was still breathing, she was still asleep. The deep bone marrow knowledge stirred in her, and she knew that from this sleep, magical and malicious as it was, the sleepers would take no harm, unlike the sleepers found in the broken fastnesses years ago, where the princess might have been. Woodwold could do this much for the little creatures that walked under its roofs. It had watched over other little creatures for hundreds of years, and had underhood understood hurt and harm and the will to do evil. But it did not comprehend sleeping and waking, any more than it comprehended walking and breathing. This was why, Rosie thought, pernicious sleep had first confused it, but had failed to hold it. Woodwold had done what it could. Now she must lead the way. Rosie stood up, looking round her wildly. She was taking deep, involuntary breaths, 
and at first she thought she had made more of an effort climbing window frames than she had realized, and then she thought she must, must be fighting off some lingering, lingering odor of the sleep spell, and then she thought she was probably frightened. But as she sucked in the air and expelled it violently, she knew that none of these things were the real reason she stood and panted. What she was, was angry. She couldn't ever remember being so angry, not even when she had knocked down the man who had been beating his horse instead of trying to free the trapped wheel of the cart, not even when she had found the whip scars, invisible under the sleek hair unless you were looking, on the colt who had been afraid of Gnarl because he had no beard. Not even when she had first begun to realize what Icor's message meant to her, to Catriona and Aunt and Barter, and Peony and Roland and Narl, and Jem and Gilly and Gable and Crantab and Horslinga, and all of the gig, the whole country, not even then. She was bursting with anger. Her skull throbbed with it. Her hands, hanging at her sides, felt hot and swollen with it. Pernicia, she shouted, we have business, you and I. There was a low laugh. And Rosie spun round and saw Pernicia walking in through the open door of the hall. How very sweet of you to be angry with me, she said. Such an invitation, anger. I might have been delayed a little longer else. She was carrying a cane in her left hand, which Rosie had not seen before, and there were several red marks on her cheek, and she had her right hand tucked into her, into her long dark streaked robe with the thorn tears in it, and Rosie's deep knowledge reminded her of the ruined castle, of what the destruction of that castle meant. We have weakened her. I could almost uh, adopt you for that. The last one and twenty years have been difficult for me, too, and I could use a good lieutenant. I have never had a good one. Rosie made a spitting, inarticulate noise. But it has gone too far for that now, has it not? That is almost a pity. One of us must die, you know. The magic will pull your whole dreary gig apart elsewise. I couldn't stop that now, even if I wished to. Although I don't wish to, you know. I want it, and the country nice and whole, to do what I like with. But I hadn't expected there to be two of you. My mistake. I almost wonder if it might be worth saving one of you. Do I mean saving? Perhaps not quite as you would mean it, but... No, I'm sure it has gone too far for that. She raised the cane, waving it gently in the air like a fan, and then paused and dropped its tip a hand's breadth or so. Fairies didn't carry wands, except in direst need, as if to aim it like a weapon. Magic can't do everything. Rosie hurled herself upon her, seizing her throat between her hands. As the two of them struck the floor, Pernicia underneath, Woodwold cried out, a shriek of wood and iron and stone, a convulsion like an earthquake, and sleeping bodies slid across the heavy floor, rebounding off each other and off pieces of equally unsettled furniture, and there were muffled, confused cries, as of sleepers caught in a nightmare. Rosie was dimly aware that something was going on round the two of them, but she had no consciousness to spare for thinking about it. Her entire focus was in keeping her hands round Pernicia's throat. She knew she had succeeded so far only because Pernicia had not imagined anyone attacking her directly, and had had no immediate ward against it. But Rosie could feel hundreds of tiny threads of magic, tickly and horrid like centipede legs, pulling at her fingers, and the cane, the wand, whatever it was, was beating at her back, and every time it hit her there was a nasty, miserable sensation, like hitting your elbow on a door, and every time it was raised it left behind it a feeling like burning. She tried to hold in her mind that image of the castle she and Gnarl and the animals pulled down. She tried to remember that they had weakened her. She told herself Pernicia hadn't turned her into a paving stone or an octopus yet, and as long as she had her hands locked where they were, she wasn't going to be able to prick her finger on a spindle. But Rosie would not last long in the strangling cloud of pernicious magic. She could already no longer see what she held. Sometimes it seemed to be a fireworm or a goblin or a Turalian. Sometimes it was only a wild-faced woman with hatred in her black eyes as they stared into Rosie's. And Rosie had only just enough strength left not to be drawn to return her gaze. Rosie's back was on fire from the blows, 
and the numb, banged elbow feeling was creeping slowly down her arms, and she would soon no longer be able to keep her fingers closed, and her hands furthermore seemed to be increasingly weighed down and muffled with something like slug slime and spider silk. She thought she heard, heard voices, but she could not tell if they were animal or human, nor if they were speaking to her or to Pernicia. She thought she saw human figures moving, but her eyes seemed to be obscured, as if sticky webs were being woven across her face as well as round her hands, and these humans, if that was what they were, moved oddly, gropingly, uncertainly, as if they were not sure if they were awake or asleep and dreaming. She thought she heard the clatter of iron-shod hooves. Gorse flung himself through the open door to the great hall, as he had flung himself through the hole in the hedge and the just horse with bow in the iron bars in the gate that had greeted Narl's great fiend-scattering shout as they had borne down upon that confused and unhappy army. The bars bounced off Narl's knees with a sound like wet dough being slapped on a kneading board as Gorse leapt through, but Narl, peony still in his arms, stayed on his back. Perhaps the gate was growing accustomed to the work, or perhaps it recognized its maker and stretched wider. Narl had followed the hounds the short way, but he had known, or at least guessed, that Rosie and Fast had won their way through, because as they neared Woodwold they met more and more unfriendly creatures, but which were less and less inclined to interfere with them, as if their commander had forgotten about them, while greater matters pressed elsewhere. Gorse's iron shoes slipped on the dancing floor, and he scrambled to keep his footing and to prevent himself from stepping on any of the half-awake people who lay there, bewildered and slow from a too heavy sleep, unable to get out of his way. He gave a short, raspy neigh. <laughs> then in a human would have been, Oh, no! And he put his head right down to see where he was sliding to, and his hindquarters down for balance. Both he and the humans were further dismayed and disoriented by the fact that the floor itself was moving in abrupt little heaves and eddies, like water striking rocks or discomfited by wind. One or two people had managed to climb to their feet, seeming to have difficulty deciding whether they needed worse to cling to some support or to clutch at their heads, as if the head seemed riskily loose on the shoulders. Roland hauled himself upright by grasping a table edge and then grappled his way from chair to chair to fall against Gorse's shoulder. Even half awake, he had recognized the burden that Narl bore before him. Peony was still wholly asleep. She did not stir while many round her were stirring. Narl slid off the sweating Gorse and carried her to the nearest table. The floor was now only making tiny tremors, like a horse shaking its skin free of a fly, and laid her down gently. Roland snatched two pillows off two chairs and placed them clumsily, for his hands were still not quite his own, under her head. Narl turned to the two struggling figures he knew to be Rosie and Pernicia, though he could see neither. Pernicia's magic and Rosie's fury wrapped them round, and he could not tell the one from the other, nor much more than make them out as two vaguely human shapes in the fiery turbulence of their battle. Fate and all the gods, he said silently to himself too frantic to say anything aloud, incapable of coherent words, and sure as well that there was nothing he could say that would be of the slightest use, and so he need not try. Rosie, could you not have waited till there was someone to help you? He knew that whatever was happening, Rosie had little time left. His only wonder was that her rage and despair had protected her this long. Where was Catriona, or Ikor, or Aunt? He looked wildly round. And that was when he noticed that not everyone in the, in the hall was waking. No fairy nor magician was doing so. Not only those of the gig, but those of the royal party as well. Catriona herself lay nearly at his feet. He knelt down beside her. Woodwold's pain and distress had rolled her onto her back. Her mouth was a little open, and her face was drawn and unhappy, as if she were half remembering something important left undone. He touched her cheek, sending his thought towards her wherever she might be, and knew at once he could not rouse her. Whoop! Almost got a little carried away with the water there. Uh... Okay, that's better. No, 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 no. And knew at once he could not rouse her. He tried a moment or two longer, thinking to find at least a clue to what held her. 
but she was too far away, and he could feel that what stood watch over her would clutch at him too if he stayed, for he too was a fairy. As it was, he was already half lost. He could feel the great hall round him and the twitching floor under his knees, but he could not take his hand away from Catriona's face, and he could not stand up and turn round. There was a great cold weight on him, bearing him down. With a great effort, he brought his other hand to the iron chain he, wound, he wore round his neck and seized the little ancient knob of it that he had welded there, and with the touch of it he could jerk his other hand back with a gasp. It would need some great magic to rescue these sleepers, and all those who could wield it slept. Pernicia had planned well. If she won, there would be that many fewer real and potential rivals or enemies for her to dispose of. If she lost, she still won, because this country would be uninhabitable without its fairies and magicians to negotiate the long, tricky series of truces with its native magics, and three-quarters of the best fairies and magicians had been in Lord Prendergast's great hall for the Princess one and twentieth birthday party. He could not think of it now. He would think of it later. Now there was Rosie, gone into battle alone, a battle she must have known she would lose. Did she think he would not follow her, to the ends of the earth if necessary? But then, what could he do against Pernicia? He stood up again, hoping for inspiration, and did not see Zell trotting up behind him. Zell went round Narl's ankles and stood by Catriona, looking into her face. Narl took one step, two, three, toward the small, terrible whirlwind that contained Pernicia and Rosie, and as he walked away, Zell put his two front feet on Catriona's breast and said, Catriona, you must wake up and help us. Narl knew nothing of that. His eye had been caught by a faint, pale stir high over his head. He looked up, and the Merrill was standing on its rafter, half-spreading its wings. It looked down at him, and he felt it was trying to catch his eye. The Merrill. The Merrill was awake. Merrills have the best far vision of any creature. A Merrill can see a harvest mouse running up a stem and into its grass globe, while the Merrill hangs a half a league above the earth. Narl, who had no beast speech, could nonetheless hear it telling him, in the nearly human language it had learned over its long years of imprisonment above Lord Prendergast's great hall, I can see her, I can see your friend, your companion, your dear one, bound in a death embrace with the fairy who has sought her life for twenty-one years. I can see her. The Merrill sat high above the floor of the hall, bound short by links of cold iron, which no magic can loose. Narl took a deep breath, and swept together all the magic that was in him, and held it, and looked at it. And then he brought the experience of all his years at the forge, working cold iron in fire, and earth, and air, and water. And he seized the magic, as if it were the raw material he was accustomed to, and bent it, and shaped it, drawing it long and thin, setting a point and an edge to it. And the magic struggled like an angry colt, for he was not accustomed to shaping magic. And it is at best, it is at best, a much less obedient servant than his iron. No magic is willing to be handled as if it were some common, dull thing, inert but for the hands of its worker, and still less may it be easily forced to the will of, of all people, a smith, and furthermore, into this magic he had to hammer some of his own being, some sympathetic tie to the qualities of iron, and this was worse yet, for it was like weaving fire and water together. The magic nearly escaped him many times, for it would have none of what he would have of it, and in the back of his mind he knew that what he strove for could not be done by the laws of the world. But he felt the thing in his hands become the weapon he needed, created perhaps more out of his own dire extremity than of anything else, and briefly he quailed, because he was not sure what it was he had made. But it was all he had, and he had no time to try anything else, and so he grasped it, aimed it, and flung it at the chain round the Merrill's ankle. He bit back a cry as it left his hands, for his magic spear burned like the fire of his forge, and he was caught in a backdraft. Catriona woke to the sound of the roof on Woodwold's great hall being ripped apart, and the scream of a hunting Merrill. She looked up and saw the Merrill that had lived in the rafters of Lord Prendergast's hall for as many years as Rosie had been alive, beating its great wings and flying up, up, out through the ragged, smoking hole in the roof, 
two or three broken links with a chain round its ankle, glittering in the sunlight, the whiteness of its beating wings as dazzling as the sun itself. It flew up into the sky till it was lost in it. Catriona looked round, trying to remember what was happening, wondering why everyone seemed to be lying or crawling about on the floor, wondering why she felt so sick and lost, feeling as if she had just been dragged a very long way through them some thick, cold, horrid, slobbery material that had blocked up her eyes so she could not see the way, and her nose and mouth so she could not breathe, and clung to her limbs so she could not move. She would be there still if it were not for whatever had so determined they dragged her absent-mindedly patting the young fox, which was standing beside her, looking at her thoughtfully. It had called her by name and asked her f asked for her help, she suddenly recalled. I just got something going on here. I'm going to mute for a minute. There we go. Mute. It had called her by name and asked her for help, she suddenly recalled, and as suddenly recalled a day almost twenty-one years before, when another fox had asked if she would come to the rescue of a fox who called her by name. She had not heard a fox speak since Rosie was a baby. She staggered to her feet. It occurred to her as quickly as it had occurred to Narl, though she could not yet put sense to it, that only the ordinary people were waking as she was waking. The fairies were all asleep. Asleep? Why were they asleep? And then she began to remember, as if it were all something she had dreamed, the night of the princess birthday party. Pernicia. Pernicia would be sure to lay her baleful sleep the heaviest on other fairies. Catriona could still taste the foul gumminess of it on her tongue. On the magicians, on the royal family themselves, those who had hoped had striven to defy her. But worse yet, Pernicia had torn Rosie away from her, Catriona. She had felt her hold loosen and break before the sleep, the awful sleep, struck her down. She remembered Peony struggling through the crowd toward the two tall women, facing each other incongruously over a spinning wheel. She did not remember any more after that, only her knowledge that she had lost Rosie. How long had she been asleep? Where was Rosie? She turned too quickly, still dizzy from sleep and waking, and almost fell. We have been to the castle, Rosie and I, and the others, said the fox at her feet. We pulled the castle down. Pulled the castle down? Unbidden, Catriona's memory produced a picture of the barren plain and the standing stones and the unfriendly eyes in the castle where she and Aunt and Barter had once briefly stood. Pulled it down. Hope surged through her and made her hands and feet tingle with warmth, and she felt healthy and strong and amazed, for she remem remembered the tales of the people who had woken out of pernicious sleep at the broken fortresses. And perhaps it was because she was thinking of castles and fortresses and that her feet were planted so firmly on Woodwold's bare floor, that briefly the bone marrow knowledge stirred in her, too. And she heard a voice that was no voice, speaking at a pitch no human ear could imagine, and it said, I am here for Rosie, princess. At that moment, Catriona raised her eyes and saw the briar roses twining round the windows, and hanging over the open doors, and knew who it was who spoke to her. Thank you, she said, not knowing if it could hear her or not, not knowing if it could understand gratitude. Thank you. But where was Rosie? She looked again at the hole in the roof, and when she dropped her gaze this time, she saw a seething royal of magic near the face of a haggard man. Gnarl. She had not recognized him. His face was grey with pain, and he was missing some of his hair, as if it had been burnt off. He held his hands in front of him, curled loosely to his breast, she glanced at them and saw that the palms were swollen and cracked and bleeding, and the sleeves of his fine coat had been tattered to the elbows, and his forearms were marked as if with tongues of fire. Naro, she said, horrified. He shook his head, and her eyes turned to follow his. She could see through the royal of magic only slightly more clearly than Naro, but she knew that what she saw was the final confrontation between Pernicia and Rosie, and that Rosie was inevitably losing. The Merrill stooped so swiftly that neither of them saw it, neither of them nor Pernicia either. Lightning is slower. The Merrill's talons seized Pernicia and wrenched her out of Rosie's slackening grasp as Woodwold opened a gulf in the earth just beneath them. Catriona thought she heard Pernicia scream, but if she spoke any magic, it did not save her, 
nor did the Merrill's hold falter. Catriona ran forward and grabbed Rosie's shoulders, pulling her back just in time, muttering a few hasty words to loose Rosie from the snare of the magic that still clutched her, and a few more words begging that Woodwall might leave some floor under the both of them while she did it. As it was, they were pitched backwards, and Narl put out his wounded arms and caught them both, and Catriona and Narl staggered out of reach, hauling Rosie with them. Catriona noticed that two long, snowy pinions had caught in Rosie's hair. Pernicia and the Merrill plunged deep into the earth, and the gulf round them spasmed, spewing raw, dry, moldy earth and fragments of ancient root and stone, and then it snapped shut, with a sound like hundreds of anvils banging together, and the noise fell upon everyone as hard as a giant's blows, and their breath was knocked out of them. But the floor where the two, those two had disappeared rose like a mountain, and avalanches tumbled down its sides, and there was a roaring, echoing noise, like many angry Tyrrhelians in a narrow valley. And there was so much fine grit in the air, that as the people in the hall opened their mouths to drag their breath in again, after losing it to the recoil of the closing of the pit, their mouths and throats were instantly full of it, and they coughed helplessly, and their lungs ached. Frightened, baffled people pressed themselves back, nearer the heart of the house, away from the front of the hall, and the mountain that had risen up there, dragging their still sleeping comrades to what safety they could. One of the walls of the hall cracked and buckled and fell down, and the sounds that the splintering wood made were like human screams. The walls on either side of it tottered and bent toward it, like grief-stricken friend toward a fallen companion, like Catriona and Narl over Rosie. The wreckage shot across the broken floor, dangerous chunks of lathe and plaster, thrown skidding up miniature peaks and launching themselves into the air on the far sides, though the central mountain was beginning to subside again in showers of chips and clods of earth. Tapestries belled out as if blown by the breath of giants. Several were torn from the wall, and one skimmed round the stricken room like a bird before it fell upon what had been the high table. Half of the table still stood, while the other half was a ragged heap of broken posts and planks and food and servingware. Rosie was only half aware of the destruction round her. Catriona had peeled the worst of pernicious binding magic away from her face and hands. But as shattered furniture and bodies slid this way and that across the writhing floor, Rosie was separated from both her and Narl, and, dizzy and nearly helpless, fetched up against something solid. She groped at it, and discovered one of the legs of the high table at the end that was still standing, and slowly worked her way upright. The bowed body next to her was familiar, its arms braced against the tabletop, but it took her a moment to recognize it. Roland bent protectively over something, and once she knew him, she guessed what, or rather who, that something was. Roland looked up then and recognized her, and in a lull in, in the diminishing sound of destruction, he said hopelessly, is there anything you can do? Rosie stopped herself from shaking her head. She found an overturned chair with a missing back but four sound legs, righted it, and knelt on it, looking into Peony's face. Her face was thinner and paler than it had been last night. Was it still only last night? And her breathing, as Rosie bent low over her, sounded strained as if a weight pressed on her breast. Roland moved back a little, as if to give Rosie room or as if he couldn't bear to look any longer, to watch Peony's life ebbing away from a wound neither of them could see. Rosie, tired and bruised and miserable and shaken and sick as she was, felt her own life beating strongly in her and reached out and took Peony's hands. She stared at her friend's face for a moment, at the face so like and unlike her own, and then she let go with one hand long enough to reach in Peony's pocket and find there the spindle end she had made for her and drew it out, and put it between Peony's hands, and clasped her own round them. One of the Merrill's feathers came loose from Rosie's matted hair, and drifted down to lie on Peony's breast. Something, something, some non-magic moved between them, princess, not princess, two young women who had traded places, who had pretended to be young, one young woman, who had become two other young women. Rosie, with her strength and her careless energy, her generosity to, generosity to everything that lived. Peony, with her gentler kindness, her subtler understanding, 
and an elasticity that had never been a part of Rosie's nature. Narl came up beside her. There were stained scraps of cloth wrapped around the palms of his hands, but when he put his gently round hers, Rosie felt him adding his strength of hope and love to her own, and she cared about nothing but, but that he should help her bring her friend back to life. Catriona was moving through the hall, waking those who still slept, against whom pernicious savage ensnaring spell had struck hardest, the fairies, the magician, the royal family. She had a long way to go to reach those, and even with Zell providing a safety line, the way was ugly and dangerous. The king and the queen and the three princes she had awakened first, drawing them back tenderly and carefully from the sticky, heavy emptiness where their spirits had been suspended, and several of the queen's ladies, who had pulled their queen and her family bodily away from the wreck of the great hall, burst into tears. Osmer woke up first. He looked round, half hearing the nearest lady's attempt to reassure him that the wicked fairy was gone and he was safe, and an admiring amazement came into his face. I've been asleep? I wish I'd seen that! Catriona discovered that she could still smile and moved on. She found Barter, who was easily awakened, and Ant, who was not, and Icor, who was harder yet, and even after his eyes were open, Catriona could see the ends of nightmares in them, gleaming like toads' backs. She turned then to the other gig fairies, and when she had recalled them, Aunt and Icor had recovered enough to help her awaken the other royal fairies and magicians. It took all three of them to awaken Sigil, whom they might not have found at all, but that they were sure she had, after all, attended to the ball. She had lain under a fallen-down tapestry, and she was so small and drab, even in her ball clothes, that she looked like a crumpled fold of vague, foresty background to the bright-woven scene of ladies gathering flowers. She opened her eyes with her head on Icor's arms, facing the window, and the first thing she saw was briar roses. Dear Woodwold, she said. Lastly, and as gently as they could, they woke Lord and Lady Prendergast and their sons and daughters, who woke to find the great hall, the oldest part of their ancient and beloved house destroyed, and for a little while the thought of a wicked fairy defeated, and their country and future monarch saved, seemed a too small a victory to them. Catriona wearily moved back toward the table where Peony lay, where Roland stood and Narl and Rosie crouched over their joined hands. The stallion Gorse stood behind Narl, and several dogs were scattered round the table's end. One of them, her name, Sunflower, swam into Catriona's mind, had her feet up on the edge of the table, where she could just raise her chin high enough to stare into Rosie's face. Gorse was as bedraggled as a wild moor horse, and had strange marks on his flanks, as if he had squeezed through a space too narrow for him. The dog's chest were all matted with foam. Catriona guessed that this was part of the story of how they had pulled down Pernicious Castle, and wondered what else she had missed while she was asleep. But those stories could wait. Catriona was exhausted. Never attack a spell head on, Ant had said years ago. You need to sniff out where the weak places are. All spells have them. It's just a matter of finding them, and of course, being able to use them. Catriona could not have found nor used the weak spot of pernicious spell. Not alone. She looked down at a small, pointed, red-furred face looking up at her. I am still here, Sal said. I am still here. They were all still here, and they were all still alive. She stood at the end of the table, looking down at the top of Peony's head, at Rosie's face fierce with concentration, and Narl looked up at her and said, half shouted, Cat, wake up! Don't you want to keep her? Catriona did not at first know what he meant, but she responded to the desperation in his voice, and saw that Peony, now alone in all the hall, remained asleep, and obediently she put her hands out and laid them as gently as she could on the burned backs of Narl's hands. But with that contact, she realized the intricate interlacings of energies at play beneath her palms, discovered, too, the secret Narl had been hiding in his forge for so many years, and suddenly understood what Narl had meant. Her fingers bit down against Narl's skin, and she put every moat of magic she had left into her into the work, for Pernicia was gone and she could, you, she could use her last strength as she chose. Aunt looked up from where she was rubbing the temples of a young fairy with a headache. 
catching a whiff or a whisper of what was happening among the remains of the high table. Icor, in one of the anterooms, strapping the sprained ankle of one of the grandest of the royal magicians, leapt to his feet and ran back to the hall, shouting, No! No! You cannot! No! Rosie leaned forward round the globe of hands and kissed Peony on the lips. Everyone's hands collapsed inwards as the spindle end shattered. Rosie felt an eerie, sucking sensation against her palms for a moment, as she involuntarily fell forward onto Peony's breast, and a queer, fluttery, disorienting sensation in her own breast and throat, as if something were being pulled out of her and drawn into her friend. Narl and Catriona both took a sudden, hasty step backward. Rosie sat up, spitting Peony's hair out of her mouth, as Peony said, Oof! Rosie, you weigh a ton! It was at this moment that the cook came howling up from the kitchen, saying that Lady Prendergast's terrier and two mice were lying asleep in the centre of the kitchen table, with a single long black hair twisted round them in a circle, that nothing could pass that boundary hair, and would some fairy please come and get these animals off her table? Chapter 23 Woodwold was not the only house that had suffered in the final confrontation. I'm just double checking here how far I have to go. And I'm almost done. Where was I? Oh, right here, 349. <clears throat> Woodwald was not the only house that had suffered in the final confrontation between Pernicia and the Princess and the Princess Allies. All over the gig there was wreckage, as if by tiny, violent, very local storms or duels among goblins, or a fireworm or two. There was a great deal of work to be done to set all to rights, but no one's village had been flattened, and friends and family gave housing and help to those who had been unlucky, and the crops and the animals were largely unhurt. Although the latter in some cases had strayed so far, some humans suspected they had been ill-sent or driven, especially when, after their initial journeys, hitherto stolid beasts showed a tiresome new urge to wander, and, of course, as soon as the news of Pernicious final defeat went out, and everyone shook themselves and stared at each other and said, How could we ever have imagined that Pernicious had just gone away? That was a very powerful spell. And everyone was a little annoyed, especially because no one could remember the end of the ball and the appearance of Pernicious, which must have been one of the best stories, if anyone could tell it. But then it was King's business and magic, and all's well that ends well. Everyone in the gig was a hero. And this pleasant knowledge helped the work to go a little quicker, as did the amount of volunteer labour that poured in from all over the rest of the country to hear the tales of heroism firsthand, in return for some digging and dragging and sawing and hammering and heaving and putting together. The volunteer labour and free goods came even more thickly when the announcement of the wedding went out. Prince Roland Jocelyn Hereward and Princess Casta Albinia Allegra Dove Minerva Fidelia Aletta Blythe Domnia Delicia Aurea Grace Isabella Griselda Gwyneth Pearl Ruby Lily Iris Briar Rose's marriage was celebrated only six weeks after the death of Pernicia and the Merrill beneath the ruins of Woodwold's Great Hall. The princess insisted that she wished to be wed in the gig from Woodwold, and the Prendergasts, whatever damage had been done to their family's ancient home, were incapable of saying no to her about anything whatsoever, aside from the fact that it was a tremendous honour. And, of course, as a result of the prospect of the princess wedding, every royal fairy and magician put their minds to the work of restoring the Prendergast's great hall, which was the only possible location in the entire gig for such an occasion as a royal wedding, so that it nearly put itself back together, and was, furthermore, now glistening with powerful new spells and good wishes, fully sound and solid and complete by the day. The new great hall, indeed, was so lofty and beautiful that the king's bishop was almost reconciled to having to hold the most important wedding of this generation in the barbarian backwater gig instead of at his, no at his own noble cathedral in the royal city. Rosie and Narl were the bride and groom's first friends, although the queues of attendance behind both of them were several dozen strong and there was a certain amount of sniffing and eyebrow-raising that a horse-leech and a smith, however dear the friendship, should come at the heads of the columns. 
Both of them felt extremely silly in the royal get-ups they were expected to wear, but both felt so complacent about their part in what had occurred, with this wedding as its culminating feat, that they almost forgot to mind. Since Rosie had begun to let her hair grow so that she could braid the Merrill's feathers into it, at least the ladies assigned to her hairdressing for the wedding, unlike those who had tried to dress it for the princess ball, had had a little to work with. Rosie's godmother gifts appeared to have stayed with her even when being the princess had left her, and her hair grew at a cracking pace, as if it had been impatiently waiting its opportunity for the last seventeen years. But the curls, while initially just as bumptious as ever, began to hang out of their own weight as they spilled past her shoulders. The royal hairdressers had taken full advantage, thinking rightly that there was fairy work in it somewhere, but grateful that this tall young woman would not spoil the show. Rosie privately thought that Narl was taking Peony's marriage remarkably well, but when, a, but when a week later they had seen the wedding party off for the royal city, and Rosie was beginning to realize just how much she was going to miss Peony, who, with twenty-one new names to choose from, had chosen to remain Peony, she couldn't stop herself from saying something about it to Narl. At least they might be able to share their sense of loss. But Narl was offhand. Well, all miss her. Lovely young woman and clever with it. She'll make a splendid queen. She has all the right instincts and the grace to make what needs doing get done. Rosie said, only speaking the truth. I can hardly imagine Foggy Bottom without her. You'll miss her worse than I, of course, said Narl. Whistling in a curiously light-hearted way, he returned to his hammer and his fire. Rosie blinked. He had been whistling like this for the last seven weeks. Narl never used to whistle. Of course, everyone was tremendously relieved at having the curse off the country for good, and the future queen officially heir selected by the future king, and married to the man and married to the man who both she and her country liked best as her consort, but but Rosie still did not clearly remember everything that had happened during the destruction of the old hall. She remembered that she and Pernicia had been grappling with each other. She seemed to remember attacking Pernicia with her bare hands but rejected this as crazy. More particularly, she remembered the white streak out of the sky and the Merrill's last words, Goodbye, friend. She knew that it was the Merrill who had saved her. And she knew that Narl and Catriona, and possibly her own Spindolin, had done something besides just wake Peony up. Her final meeting with Peony had been extremely painful. Even if they did manage to keep a courier busy round the year with their letters to each other, and any sort of writing was not Rosie's favorite activity. It came approximately second to embroidery. Even if Rosie did go up to the royal city at least once a year herself, their friendship was going to be nothing like it had been for the last six years. Peony herself would become, was already becoming, someone else than she had been. She had to. Rosie supposed that even she herself would change. What had happened to them wasn't like losing your best friend, so much as it was like losing your shadow or your soul. You barely knew it was there sometimes, but you knew it was crucial to you. There had been tears of joy and despair on both sides, that Rosie would stay where she was, in a world and a life that suited her, and that Peony had found a life that suited her, that suited her as if she had been born to it, and people who loved her, most particularly one person who loved her, Roland. But I can't, she said, as she began to understand what had happened, but I'm not. Neither am I, said Rosie, through her own tears. I'm really not. I wasn't, even when I was supposed to be. I just, I wasn't, even when Icor, she stopped. Icor had not spoken to her since the ball, had not come near her, if, as has happened, if, if has, uh, blah, 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 if has had happened once or twice during her visits to Woodwold, she had entered a room that he was in, he left at once. At least she had seen him that once or twice, and so had seen Esqua, regrown and shining, hanging from his belt. Peony looked at Croc's head on her friend's knee, and Sunflower's head on her foot, and at Fwab singing the Chaffinch Spring Song on the windowsill, and the Cook's Cat just happening by the doorway, where they were sitting in one of the little anterooms off the Great Hall, the latter alive with the hum and bang of feverishly working magic augmented carpentry, just happening to sit down there for a wash, her back to the embarrassing tedium of human tears. The animals know. The animals will always know the truth of it. The animals knew. 
they still called Rosie Princess, and she had heard the tale that had gone round after the wreck of the hall and what came of it. Bernicia is dead. Rosie and Orochral, which was how Rosie learned for the first time that the Merrill had a name, killed her. Rosie is staying here. Peony is going back to the city to be the princess instead. Yes, said Rosie, but they're not telling, except each other, and they'll stop that too soon enough. They'll close it down. Zell, who was so puffed up with importance for having become Catriona's familiar, there was almost no bearing him, is already trying to, because he knows Cat's worried. He hasn't yet learned that Cat, Cat is always worried, she added, less easily, and Peony, it, that I talked to animals should never have happened. That it did happen may have been what made the rest happen, or made it possible to happen, that pernicious curse didn't work, that we found a way out, that I'm, you're, we're still here. Peony took Rosie's hands in hers, and squeezed them painfully. You're sure? You're sure? It doesn't matter if I'm sure or not, it's done, said Rosie. But seeing the look on her friend's face, she added, I was there, remember? If I hadn't been sure, it couldn't have happened. Whatever did happen, she amended, remembering Narl's and Catriona's hands on hers, and the queer feeling that she had gone somehow invisible or insubstantial and that the spindle end, just before it imploded into emptiness, had been the own, only real thing about either herself or Peony. But she had felt something pass between her and Peony when she kissed her, something that had come trudging up from the depths of her own being, something she herself had called out, and Narl and Catriona had given the capacity to come in response to that call, something she hardly recognized as hers, except that she knew by the small, surprised blank it had left behind when it moved, that it had been there all her life till then, and had planned to stay there for the rest of her life as well, something that hopped quietly over to Peony when their mouths met. Think of Roland. Just keep thinking about Roland. And Peony smiled through her tears. Rosie had been called into the Queen's private room once, too, the day before the wedding. Rosie had been uncomfortable at going to meet the woman she knew to be her mother, remembering, too, that the Queen had known when the deception was still a deception. The Queen had stared at her as if trying to remember something. I'm sorry, the Queen said to the foggy bottom horse leech. I cannot think who you remind me of. It's very rude to stare, even for Queens, especially for Queens. She smiled. And Rosie thought of the story Catriona told, of her standing in her father's kitchen, making supper when the king's messengers had come to offer her a throne. Rosie smiled back and then curtsied, not too clumsily. Three months of being the princess' first lady-in-waiting had had some effect, having no idea what to say. "'You are my daughter's best friend,' the queen said slowly. "'I want to remember you clearly till I can come to know you. For well, you will come up to the city sometimes to see your friend, will you not? Rosie nodded, a lump suddenly in her throat, and then croaked politely, Yes, ma'am. I hope we can be friends too. Something about your face, whatever it is. I think my heart's, my, my daughter's heart chose its friend well. I would like to be your friend too, said the queen. The queen held out her hand. And Rosie knelt as she took them and bowed her head over them. But the queen freed one of her hands and stroked Rosie's head and touched the Merrill's feathers. At that moment, the door of the queen's chamber opened and a little round person walked in. Rosie looked up. And that was where we ended. The last bit of this is in part 14, two of two, which will be posted shortly after this. Thank you for tuning in to Spindle's End. Enjoy!